Moses commanded the people not to be afraid when going to battle. Now that's very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hember. I'm Janice. And are you afraid when you have to make a confrontation with somebody, especially in battle? Very interesting. Well, and this program is called Bible Discovery TV, and we're learning about this as we go through Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 20, we're going to study that in about five minutes time. It's going to be very interesting, Janice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Corey is here. Corey? I'm also going to be taking a look at Deuteronomy 20, but this time at a rule regarding fruit trees. Ryan? Today, I'm looking at how dairy products were made in the ancient Middle East. All right. Very good. Uh, and you are doing what, Jan? On the verge of battle. All right, so we have Janice and Ryan, or, uh, Ryan and Corey coming up in 25 minutes, or 20 minutes. Janice is coming up in 25 minutes, so get your Bible guide out. Let's open the Bible and listen to what God is saying to us right now. Deuteronomy 20, 1 through 9. When you go out to battle against your enemies, and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be, when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man marry her. The officers shall speak further to the people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. And so it shall be, when the officers have finished speaking to the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 21, 22, and 23. We cover a lot today as we continue to go through the book of Moses. You know, there is no country in history that has not faced war. Now, modernists like to claim that we don't get in fights and we don't fight wars anymore, that everyone inherently is good. But they're wrong. We do. Wars are often fought for subjective, greedy, and fearful human reasons. Fear and greed is not just leading to war, but they also lead to starvation. Now, this planet has enough food supply on it to feed everyone everywhere, despite the famines that we hear about around the globe. Starvation is a result of our sin-filled, selfish attitude towards others. And the evil in this world is the work of human flesh. The good in this world is a result of human flesh coming into the obedience under divine desire. When we face the reality of human thinking, which is greedy and fearful by nature, we end up in war just to survive. Yet Moses told Israel when they readied themselves for war not to let their heart faint. In fact, he said, do not fear or panic, or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight against your enemies to give you the victory. In verses 3 and 4 of the chapter that we're reading today. 
Now, this is absolutely fascinating. And as we begin to study this, we're looking at principles for warfare. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Let's pray. Father, help us today as we open up your word and look at these passages of Scripture. We focus on the wars that they're facing and the difficulties they're having. But Lord, I pray that we would learn from this in Jesus' wonderful name, because this is your word. So help us today, Lord, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you don't have a Bible guide, my question is why not? You can call to us or write us. We'll send you a Bible guide. You can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and you go to Bible Discovery, click on the Bible guide, and it'll take you to a page where you can download it uh, actually yourself. And we encourage you. Thank you for your donations. They very much appreciated. They keep us alive. Very good. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Verse one says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. Verse 4, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight your battles for you against your enemies to save you. Now this is fascinating. Moses commanded the people not to be afraid when going into battle. The Lord was with them. Now, do not be afraid. God is bigger and stronger than any of our battles. <laughs> you know, I think that that's something we often forget, isn't it? We have difficulties, we have problems, and we often say, how are we going to deal with this? It's so much bigger than me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then we realize, wait a minute, everything I've gone through in my life, if we are Christian, everything I've gone through, God can defeat for me. God can show me how to weather it and make me stronger on the other end. Now, that's very important to remember as we focus on this passage. Now, if we go on, we read more from Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 5. It says, then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Interesting. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man Eat of it. Interesting. Verse 7. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man marry her. Now, this is fascinating. Those men who had not yet built their first house, eaten of their vineyard, or had not been married were released from fighting. You see, God desires his people to be ready for the conflicts and not to go in unprepared. God desires us to be ready for the conflict, beloved. So we have to understand that this life that we live in today is training. We are training. So Father, help us to train and help us to know. And Lord, as we go through this life in your word, we need to make it part of our life. In Jesus name. So we need to remember that this is the principles that Moses was telling Israel. We need to remember that. Now let's go on to verse 20 or chapter 20, verse eight and nine. Here's what it says. The officers shall speak further to the people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. Fascinating. And then verse nine says, and so it is. And so it shall be when the officers have finished speaking to the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people, which brings me to the last point. 
fear could have no place within the Israelite military. Fear was not the place for the Israelite military. Followers of Jesus Christ are not to fear. Remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. Now listen carefully because this is important. As we focus on our lives and as we look at God, we remember how many times did Jesus Christ say to his disciples, fear not, do not be fear. Where's your faith? Fear is not just an emotion, it's a spirit. And the enemy uses fear. There is no great motivator like fear. But there is a better motivator, and that motivator is love. God's love, 1 Corinthians 13, leads us through fear. And so, beloved, many people are fearful today over things happening in the world, wars and conflicts and everything else. But keep your heart steadied on the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that we are not destined if we love the Lord and give our lives to him. We are not destined for his wrath, but we are destined. We've received his salvation and we're destined for his mercy. So keep that in mind. That is very, very important. Now we live in a time when I think it's unique and it's different. And, you know, through the world o meter and several other places, we can see that it's a different time in which we live. But God is still God. And he still keeps those who love him. And so we need to stay close to him forever. And we need to be with him. So may we do that today. Father, help us to not be wrapped up in fear, but help us to be touched by your love and move forward according to your will. So as you read Deuteronomy 20, you'll come across a rule for Israel that's a little bit of an interesting one. So God says in uh, verse 19, when you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an ax to them because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. And it continues on like that. So there's this rule for Israel about not cutting down fruit trees, even in a time of war. Now, this is really interesting interesting uh, because contextually, the other cultures, what we know of ancient warfare is that it was an ancient tactic to go in and to raise a territory, to burn its fields, to cut down its forests, really to devastate the landscape so that it removes the hope of the people. Even if they were to survive the besiegement of their city, their land is devoid of food, so they're probably going to starve to death anyway. It's this tactic. Well, this tactic is removed from Israel. In light of this, let's take a look at some of the fruit trees that were grown in ancient Israel. Throughout the Bible, there are many references to different types of fruit trees. Nearly synonymous with the Middle East even today is the olive tree, which is mentioned in the Bible as one of the main products of Israel. In the ancient world, olives were grown for their oil rather than for the fruit in its raw state. These evergreen trees bloom in the early summer with hundreds of small white flowers. At harvest time, the trees would be beaten with sticks to dislodge the olives that would be collected and carried off to be pressed for their oil. Olive oil had many applications. It was a staple of food preparation, was used medicinally to treat wounds, practically as fuel for lamps, and religiously as offerings for anointing and to light the tabernacle and temple. Biblically, olive trees are used symbolically to represent blessing, and on the flip side, their destruction is seen as God's judgment. They're also used as a symbol of beauty. And famously, the prophets likely have olive trees in mind when they spoke of the Messiah as a shoot from the stump of Jesse. 
Olive trees were propagated not by seeds, but by their natural growth pattern of sending out shoots from the base of the trunk, which could be cut off and rooted into a whole new tree. Even after felling an olive tree, leaving only the stump, the tree would send out these shoots from the base, which in Israel became a symbol of children rising and growing on after the death of their fathers. Psalm 128 verse 3 says, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Pomegranates were also cultivated in ancient Israel, and the interior seeds of the fruit were eaten fresh, dried for longer storage, pressed for juice, wine, and syrup production, and the fruit rinds may have been used medicinally. Symbolically, pomegranates were used to represent fertility or fruitfulness, and they adorned the priestly clothing, the decor of the temple, and were a popular design in everyday life. Figs were another important fruit grown in ancient Israel. They were a key element of the economy, and they had two harvests, the winter harvest, which was eaten fresh, and the summer harvest that was dried either individually or in cakes for food storage. For Israel, fig trees also symbolize that blessing of their covenant with God, and their destruction is envisioned as God's judgment. The sycamore trees of the Bible are also a type of fig tree, and these give six or more yields of fruit each year. Their figs were considered common food, and it's believed that in some instances, they may have been grown specifically for their wood. Dates, which grow on many varieties of date palm trees, were grown in locations throughout Israel and require extra care to ensure pollination of the flowers. The products of date palms are dates, of course, as well as date honey. Its leaves are used in the making of baskets and woven products, its fibers make cloth and rope, and its sap can be extracted as a fresh or fermented drink. So there we go. Always really interesting to try to jump into uh, the mindset or at least the time period of ancient Israel, just to kind of get more of a context, more of an understanding of what's going on here uh, in this very ancient literature. Yeah, that's really important to remember that the Bible itself is ancient. And mm -hmm. so it's but it's not irrelevant because to be old is not irrelevant. Now, it just it, takes a little bit more work to understand. Of course it does. Mm -hmm. But today we, we're in a culture that worships youth, but we we have to understand that to be older is not to be irrelevant. I think that's very interesting. Okay, Ryan. All right, well, my segment today is all about how different dairy products were made in the ancient Middle East. And we see reference to dairy products in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 14. But really it's Proverbs chapter 30, verse 33 that gives us some insight into how these products were actually made. And what's really cool is that the writer of this proverb uses this imagery to teach us a valuable lesson about the nature of anger and strife. But let's take a look at how people in the ancient East produced tasty dairy products. The Hebrew word chema occurs no less than 10 times in nine different verses throughout the Old Testament canon. The King James Version of the Bible always translates this word as butter, though other translations render it in various different ways, such as curds, cream, curdled milk, and even cheese. While there has been some question surrounding the accuracy of the KJV's translation of this Hebrew word as butter, we do know that butter was known about in ancient Israel at least. As it's been pointed out, since some adjacent countries knew and used butter, such as the Hittites, and with their sheep, goats, and cows were butter makers, it seems probable that the Hebrews also had it. As a matter of fact, the mere action of transporting milk from place to place would produce churned butter, and the churn-type vessels known from archaeology would be ideal for that purpose. It also seems that this Hebrew word can refer to a range of different dairy products, including butter. As one scholar explains, dairy products were an important element of the diet of the ancient world. Due to the lack of refrigeration, the milk from cows, water buffalo, sheep, or goats could not all be consumed before going sour. So to prolong the life of this vital resource, the milk was put into goat skins, buffalo skins, or clay vessels and curdled by agitating it in various ways. The resulting product would range from cream to butter to cheese, depending on the exact process followed. These products could be kept for periods ranging from a week to several months. 
The 19th century Reverend James Freeman, in his great work Bible Manners and Customs, explained well the specific process that was involved. Sometimes the skin containing the milk is shaken to and fro, or beaten with sticks. Sometimes it is placed on the ground and trodden upon. Again, it is pressed or squeezed with the hands so that the contents become agitated and greatly coagulate. The Bible actually seems to allude to this last method in Proverbs 30, verse 33, where it says, For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Interestingly, curds are still made in a similar way today, though they now go by the name of leaven. Leaven is produced by churning somewhat fermented milk, resulting in a kind of butter and buttermilk. This is put into cloth bags, and the water is squeezed out, leaving the leaven. Thick curds may be made by boiling the leaven and hardening it into granulated cakes, which may later be pounded up and mixed with water to reconstitute leaven. This product is much used by desert Bedouin during the non-milking season of the herds. Well, I really do hope that you enjoyed this report as much as I did. You know, it really is interesting to see the processes by which Middle Easterners made some of their dairy products and how it's still made today in a similar way. And I really, really like how the writer of this proverb passage uses the process to teach us about the nature of anger. He says, for, the pressing, for pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Words of wisdom that we all should take to heart. So in other words, the idea here is that uh, how you prepare the food, if you do it the wrong way or you do it quickly or you're, you're pushing to do it, then it may not be what you really may not turn out to be what you really like. Right. Yes. So now then if you take time and prepare the food properly, then you will have a better eating experience. Isn't that interesting? It is. You know, it's sometimes it's fun to just stop and take a look at some of the practices of ancient man, right? Because there are Absolutely. people like you and me. And I think it's important because, you know, we have to remember because we live in a fast food culture today, you know, the Western diet, the takeout. But we need to understand that when we fix food and when we do things and prepare them, that you know, we're, we just need to take it easy and enjoy ourselves and do that because that's how God works. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, it was all organic back then, that's for sure. <laughs> well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you think about today, too, you, we have bread makers, but it still takes time. It does. Mm -hmm. There's a process with the yeast. And, um, and whether we like it or not. You have a timer on your clock and you set it when we make bread and you say at this time, pull the lid up it and unplug it. It literally has its own little timer in it, built in. But you, we, you still have to wait for the process of the yeast. That, to that's fascinating. We're, right. to, we're in a culture that doesn't wait for anything. Fascinating. But we have to wait for bread. We have to wait for bread. But it's worth it. <laughs> well, it is. And, and dairy products. Like and Ryan was yeah. like, yeah, yeah. I've yes. made yogurt before. It takes time. It takes time, mm -hmm. it takes yes. time for that bacteria, that helpful bacteria to grow. It takes time. Excellent. <laughs> well, and, and okay, so my, has, my segment has nothing to do with bread <laughs> or time. But it's called On the Verge of Battle because my key verse in Deuteronomy 2, chapter 2, because these are principles governing warfare that we're reading about here today. So it says here, so it shall be when you are on the verge of battle. This is speaking to the Israelites. When you are on the verge of battle, not if, but when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. Now notice that God's people here didn't go through life the easy way. Just because they were God's people didn't mean that everything was, you know, butterflies and rainbows. They had trouble and they had battles. Now, if we read on in verse three, and the priest shall say to them, and here's what the priest would say, hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Here's the first thing he said, do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And then after that, we have verses where the priests would um, kind of go through our different, different um, uh, situations in life that the men would go through. For example, have you built a new house? Well, then you don't have to go. Have you planted a new vineyard? Well, then you don't have to go. Um, are, you, are you betrothed to be married? You don't have to go. Um, who's fearful and faint-hearted? 
We can't have anyone come with us who is fearful or faint-hearted because that is going to get into the hearts of the other men who are going to go. So there was certain um, things that were given here from the priest. Now, you're saying, probably saying, Janice, where are you going with this? You know what? As believers, we too face battles in our life every day. They can be physical battles. They can be spiritual battles. But the difference is that God is with us. We have God with us, just like the children of Israel did. Did you hear what the priest said? Don't let your heart faint. Do not be afraid and do not tremble or be terrified. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies. Now, we may not be facing these kind of battles one-on-one -on -one in combat, but we do, as I said before, face physical battles. We face spiritual battles. Remember 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. Paul was speaking to the believers in Corinth, and he said, For though we walk, he was speaking to believers, followers of Jesus. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing down every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And again, in Ephesians, Paul goes through a series of messages reminding followers of God how to live. You can see those examples, chapters four, five, and six, and it reminds us believers to put on the armor of God when we face these battles and these trials. That means it's our action. It's our action that matters. Our armor doesn't just, we don't just say clothes, there they are, they're laying there, you know, Pants, get on. Shirt, get on. We have to put them on. Let's remember, we need to follow Jesus Christ and we need to put on that armor every day. It's called Beyond the Call, and if you look it up on YouTube, Pastor Rod Hembry, that's the channel, and subscribe to it, Pastor Rod Hembry. Then every time we do a new one, and we've got several new ones that are coming all the time, it's the testimony of how God changed their life. How did God become more than just a name to them? We give that testimony on Beyond the Call. Today, let's pray. Lord, help me to serve you, no matter who my earthly government is or where I'm at. I want to serve you. 